Chapter 4. The Growth Mindset Failure, as I mentioned, is an opportunity for growth. It is the most important opportunity for growth, but it is certainly not the only opportunity, nor should you wait for failure to instigate growth. Growth is a necessary part of creation and becomes increasingly important the longer you persist in any medium. Classical Guitar, a short anecdote. A few years ago, I put out a reflection video talking about why I abandoned the classical guitar. I didn't stop playing the instrument completely, but I stopped being a classical guitarist and doing all the things that classical guitarists usually do, like practicing the standard repertoire and performing it. There were lots of responses to that video, far more than I anticipated, but the most common reaction was one of hostility or bewilderment. There were people who couldn't seem to understand why I would just drop something that had been so central to my life and something through which I had earned a living for a decade. Some thought it had to be because I was bad. I was in fact very good, hence I could make money playing. Others thought it was because I lacked some sort of artistic purity that is endemic to classical guitar. The latter was probably closer to the truth. There were lots of reasons, including my deteriorating hearing. But the main reason I abandoned classical guitar was because of malaise born out of overwhelming boredom. Originally, I enjoyed the technical challenge of playing the repertoire. It spurred huge musical growth and helped me to grow as an artist. Then, I enjoyed taking my guitar out and making money with it. I enjoyed teaching guitar at the college level and to individual students. After a while, though, it became an empty experience. I cared nothing for the music I played because I had not completely created it myself. I felt no special purpose. Did the world really need me to record and perform the same guitar pieces every other academic player has learned over the last 30 years? Was there really anywhere else to go in this field? Practicing became a burden simply because it pointed to nothing for me. I had stagnated, and I longed for growth. I tried a lot of other things, but I struggled to work outside the classical area. It's very hard to form a decent band, and as a classical guitarist I could always make money by myself. It was all under my control, and it was hard to abandon something that had both once given me purpose and continued to give me money. So it was that when I turned 29, I decided to abandon music and become a writer. I threw my whole self into the endeavor, playing guitar only occasionally to upload videos to YouTube, for I wanted people with modest means to be able to learn music for free, the original motivation for the creation of my YouTube channel. It was one of the best decisions I ever made, but the transition was very painful. I had a lot of self-identity still tied to music, and I ended up working in music as a public school teacher after that, which was like a reminder that I couldn't ever fully escape my prison. Eventually, I did return to music and recorded an ambient rock album called Memories Adrift, mostly by myself. I really would not have been able to do it had I not had the very painful transition away from classical music. I had to grow a lot to be able to just go back and do simple compositions again. It was my mindset that needed adjusting, not my technique. Growth is usually painful. Growing hurts. I remember as a child complaining to my father that my shins hurt. He said it was growing pain and that it meant I was getting bigger. This was years before I learned about the pain of bodybuilding. It hurts to grow physically. It also hurts to grow intellectually and spiritually. You should have a mindset that not only accepts this pain as proper and expected, but actively seeks it out. Bodybuilding, an anecdote. When I was 27, I moved to Las Vegas. My father had been killed the previous year in a workplace incident, and the trauma of that loss hit my family hard. I was still teaching. I was still playing guitar. I knew I needed a big change. I got a phone call asking if I could take a position in Las Vegas in 10 days. I agreed. When I got to Sin City, I weighed close to 300 pounds. Years of negligence and outright abuse had taken their toll on my body. There was a gym in my apartment complex, and somehow, I got the itch to turn my body around. I think the inception was a video on YouTube from Scooby, an infamous fitness personality that is known for being hyper-honest about everything. He said it would take about five years of work to build 30 or 40 pounds of muscle, and that food shouldn't need to taste good, and while that would turn off most people, it inspired me. That was a challenge, and one that I needed to take. The job I had when I got to Vegas was not what I was promised. I had about half the work I was supposed to have, and that meant I had to live my life very lean financially. I had no money for a social life. However, since there was little work in the way of hours, I also had a lot of free time on my hands. 
it was a perfect environment for incredible growth. Oddly, I didn't grow much as a musician, despite my best efforts. I did grow in terms of my body. I grew as a writer too, but that's not where I spent most of my focus and effort. I went to the gym every day, sometimes twice, for hours at a time. I honed my diet through countless iterations. I was sore and hungry every day for months on end. Within two years, I had transformed my body into something much closer to the ideal. I learned three important lessons from the entire effort. One, you are what you do repeatedly. Two, everything is completed one step at a time. Three, discomfort is not something to avoid. My current creative process was definitely influenced by my fitness routine. Crafting an attractive body was the result of steps. I knew completing other large projects, like books, would happen the same way. I was able to, with my roommate, also complete several screenplays by the time I left, and many of those days working on those projects were painful but necessary. Growth or decay, there is no standing still. This is another harsh reality of both biology and spirit. If you are not growing, you are decaying. Life grows. It reaches its zenith, and then it begins to age. To decay. This is a natural process that our culture is very concerned with halting. But one of the things I learned from my intense focus on the physical is that it is true on smaller time scales as well. If you are hitting the gym hard, you will grow. You will get stronger. Your muscles will get physically larger and more robust. When you stop stressing your body in this way, you don't stand still. You begin to shrink and get weaker. When things come to a halt, they don't stay frozen. They go backward. Plantar fasciitis, an anecdote. Toward the end of my time in Las Vegas, I had learned a great deal about my body, enough to know that taking bodybuilding further than I had would either yield very little results for the increased effort as I approached my natural peak, or I would need to start taking steroids. The reality was that most of the fitness models that are used to sell gym memberships and supplements are enhanced athletes. I decided to realign my goals toward general fitness and changed my focus toward more cardiovascular intensive routines. Again, I saw lots of growth and got even more fit and lean than I had been prior. This wasn't going to last though. When my wife went into labor with our first child, I made a stupid decision and, instead of putting on my work boots to take her to the hospital, I put on an older pair of running shoes that I thought would be comfortable. My wife was in labor for 24 hours without drugs by the way, and there was nowhere in the delivery room for me to sit. I stood for 24 hours straight in worn out shoes. I didn't feel the repercussions of this immediately, but not to take anything away from my wife, who certainly suffered more than I did. Within a few days, I would find it almost impossible to walk or even stand. I developed plantar fasciitis in both of my feet. Not only that, but I had to start a new job when my son was just five days old. It was also a teaching job, requiring me to be on my feet for a minimum of six hours per day, and included me walking across a very large campus twice. I did everything I could to try to make it through those early days. I put special insoles into my dress shoes. I sat down as much as I could, and I iced and heated the arches of my feet whenever possible during the day. It forced me to rethink everything. I couldn't exercise, or at least I couldn't do the exercises I had been doing for two years. I couldn't even walk without experiencing intense pain, and I couldn't take any time off. I ended up gaining almost 30 pounds in the six months after my son was born, erasing years worth of work on my body, which I thought was important. I decayed. When I was finally able to get back to the gym, I had trouble doing a single pull-up. Change something once a year. When I was forced to rethink my body, I also rethought the other things in my life. I rethought my YouTube channel and turned it into an analysis and commentary channel rather than focusing on guitar instruction. Guitar stuff wasn't popular. I rethought my approach to writing and publishing and eventually self-published my first book, a samurai tale called Muramasa Blood Drinker, in 2016. I rethought the purpose of exercise in my life. 2015 to 2016 was some of the biggest growth I had ever had in my life. I reflected and realized that each year prior to that had been equally huge in terms of growth. That is also when I noticed that every single year of my life had held within it some gigantic change. Growth in every area of my life was spurred on by huge stresses, big changes, 
and those changes forced the severing of ingrained habits. This became a bit of a personal philosophy for me. Change something big about your life every year. It has to be something big. We're not talking about switching from wheat bread to rye here. We're talking about something that makes you totally reorganize your static routines, your mindset, and your understanding of your goals. What I mean is things like changing your job, where you live, who you work for, what genre you write in, your entire wardrobe, etc. You could also get married or have a child. Even something like switching up your workout routine or getting a dog can spur growth. Here are some big changes that happened to me, in order. Switched my musical focus to classical guitar performance. Left academia. Moved cities. My father was killed. Moved cities again, this time to Las Vegas. Changed my body. Moved again within Las Vegas. Switched creative careers to writing. Moved again to Los Angeles. Switched my day job to public school teaching. Within one month, bought a house, got married, moved cities again. Had a child. Changed the focus of my writing career. Quit my day job. Moved again. Had a second child. Started writing nonfiction. The only place where I really stagnated or moved backward was in 2018 before my wife and I decided to buy a different house. It had been more than a year without a big change. I had quit my day job a year prior and was spinning my wheels in multiple places after a huge beginning to the year. The move was probably the most stressful move I ever did, partially because I had accrued more stuff, partially because I had a child and a pregnant wife to worry about while we sold one house and bought another. The shock was what I needed though, and it made me realign things. I was able to quickly write and publish an experimental type of book, something I would repeat after the birth of my daughter to some unexpected success. The wheels were turning again. I was able to quickly cut some weight that had been sticking around for more than a year. Then my daughter was born. Final Fantasy with Aurelia, an anecdote. The birth of my daughter was another huge blessing and a huge stressor. My wife had suffered a difficult pregnancy, but an easy birth, as far as such things go. Aurelia, as we named her, had her own stresses. She suffered from infant reflux due to a mechanically weak esophageal sphincter. This is something she grew out of, but for the weeks following her birth, she couldn't sleep unless she was being held upright. That meant my wife and I had to sleep in shifts and sit in an easy chair holding the baby so she could rest. Because of the mechanics of holding a tiny human, I couldn't do much besides hold her. The only thing I could reasonably do, or read on a phone or Kindle, or, as I discovered, play on the Nintendo Switch. This was due to Nintendo's odd design choice when it came to their controllers. The Joy-Cons that come with the system can be held one in each hand and used as a single, typical controller. I hadn't realized until those days that such a choice could be a blessing for people who suffer from physical disabilities that make holding a traditional controller uncomfortable or impossible. During this time, my work also came to a halt, somewhat unexpectedly. I had anticipated the difficulty of dealing with a young baby and recovering mother, and thus appropriately set up my latest book release and my social media schedule to compensate. I hadn't anticipated that I would get no work done at all, but that is what happened. This turned out to be a kind of blessing, because it forced me to grow yet again. I had been working relentlessly for years at this point, going so far as to take a laptop or guitar with me on every vacation I ever took so I could work on the road. Now, I simply couldn't work. I could read and play games, though. After talking to a friend about it, I decided to buy the Final Fantasy VII port for the Switch, considering I hadn't really touched it since the 90s. It's a game lots of people have a great deal of affection for, but I had never latched onto in the same way. I'm a big JRPG fan, but I liked other games in the series much more. I had learned a lot about analysis between my teen years and my 30s, so it was actually a very enjoyable experience. Approaching the game from the perspective of, how does this game work? Why do so many people love it? Those little controllers were also a blessing for my wife, because she did some of the same things with some other games. It is rare that I purposefully set aside large portions of time to consume media that I enjoy, whether it is movies, games, or books, and my daughter's inability to sleep had forced me to do just that. It was an exhausting experience in many ways, but it was also the first vacation I had taken in a very long time, a vacation where I truly let go of my impulse to work and just recharged my mind and spirit. There are definitely worse things than holding babies. 
I also decided to take the same analytical approach I took to Final Fantasy to some other things and read some books far outside my normal genres, specifically Twilight, much to the chagrin of my YouTube subscribers. That experience made me grow, too. Sometimes growth happens against your will. Perhaps it mostly happens against your will, but that is another discussion. Sometimes you grow in ways you don't expect. Always be growing. So here's everything I have to say about growth put simply. 1. Growth happens through stress. 2. If you aren't growing, you are decaying. 3. Seek out growth when necessary. Embrace big changes when they are forced on you. 4. Failure is an opportunity for growth. So, don't avoid failure. Don't avoid stress. Don't be afraid to take some risks.